Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to this episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Jake Porter, and I am joined this week by one of my favorite people, Pam Blizzard. Uh, Pam is a recovering spouse and certified coach, writer, and educator. She's trained in partner betrayal trauma, trauma-informed group facilitation, couple center recovery, uh, all working with folks who have sex addiction or have experienced betrayal trauma. She is a passionate advocate for betrayed spouses and is really, really capable of reminding them of their own authority and power as they seek to recover. She leads RecoveredPeace.com, a coalition of trained, recovering, betrayed spouses who provide trauma-informed education and support for other betrayed wives. She has a passion for teaching trauma-informed recovery skills, especially boundaries that are compassionate and just. She lives with her recovering husband and adult son and their cat Milo in southeastern Tennessee. In this episode, Pam and I are going to talk about cognitive distortions that are often experienced by partners post-betrayal. We are going to explore how trust erosion affects our perceptions, leading to misconceptions such as overgeneralization, emotional reasoning, catastrophizing, and many others. Uh, Pam is so good at using real-life stories to illustrate these distortions, opening up, sharing from her own personal experience, and we're going to also offer some practical advice for overcoming these distortions. Uh, This discussion is going to provide you a lot of insight into how cognitive distortions can sabotage relationship recovery and suggest some strategies for fostering communication, understanding, and healing after betrayal. Now, before we turn to this wonderful conversation, I do just want to thank AppSats for being uh, the sponsor of this podcast. This is the official podcast of the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists. AppSats exists to um, uh, advocate for betrayed partners and provide uh, gold standard training uh, in betrayal trauma. And there are a lot of opportunities to learn from AppSats coming up. I want to mention just a few of them. Every month, AppSats offers some sort of continuing education opportunity. Coming up August the 4th, there's going to be a panel discussion titled Successful Clinician Coach Collaborations for Betrayed Partners. Great panelists, wonderful discussion coming up there. And on September 1st, um, uh, AppSats coach Kim Hansen Petroni We'll do a continuing education session on the partner's role in couples work. Now, looking ahead a few months beyond that, a couple of big things coming up that I want to go ahead and let you know about so you can secure your spot now. Very exciting. In November, the 1st through the 3rd of November, will be the APSATS 2023 conference. This will be held online. There will be lots of great speakers. Um, I have the honor of getting to present at that conference along with many others. Check that out. Also, if you've never taken the multidimensional partner trauma model training, the MPTM training, it's really the cornerstone training of APSATS in which we teach the model for dealing, uh, helping couples and, and, and betrayed partners Uh, deal with the devastation of discovering sex addiction and betrayal trauma. November 14th through 17th, that training will be offered again. You can find out about all of these events online at appsats.org. That's A-P-S-A-T-S dot O-R-G. Just go there and go to the training schedule. You'll find uh, descriptions of all of these events, plus much, much more. All right, without any further ado, I look forward to introducing you to the first half of my conversation with Pam Blizzard on cognitive distortions.
Well, welcome, Pam. Thanks for coming on Betrayal Recovery Radio. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor that you asked me to be on. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've, I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, you really are one of my favorite colleagues. You really are, Pam. You are so authentic, so sincere, so brave, so encouraging. And um, and you've been encouraging me to me, not just uh, professionally, but personally as well. And I just want to say thank you before we jump in. Uh, oh, ditto. Thank you. <laughs> ditto thank you for being you. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you just start out? I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to our audience and anyone who doesn't know you. Okay. Well, I am Pam Blizzard. I am a recovering betrayed spouse. Um, in my journey, uh, my husband and I, my husband is in recovery finally um, for six years. We like to say that we paid the experience tax. Oh, we made wow. just about every mistake that people on this journey could make. And we would like people to benefit mm. from our mistakes. And so mm. to that end, when people started asking me, you know, for insights and and to sponsor them. Um, I was really afraid to do more damage, like some helpers have done to me. And sure. so um, I uh, luckily found APSATS. And so I have completed the four-day training, the multidimensional partner trauma model. Um, I've also taken um, peer facilitation, trauma-informed peer facilitation with uh, Door of Hope. Yes. And I've taken a little bit of your training. Yes, you have. There's a lot more <laughs> in the couple centered recovery model. And it's just, I have found it so brilliant, so encouraging. And mm. I just wish, I wish you were around when we started this journey. Oh. Our journey would have been much shorter. So no, oh, thank you, Pam. Thank you. And um, you know, we the the whole idea for this episode came up um, I don't know, a month or so ago, back when we were recording. You were here with uh, Lachelle Burkett and with Bonnie Burns, uh, Hope talking for wives about podcast. Hope for Wives Hope podcast. For wives. Exactly. <laughs> and you, it was kind of in passing when you mentioned it, but you talked about cognitive distortions as something that you teach um, your clients as you're working with betrayed partners. And immediately my ears perked up and I was like, Pam's got to come back and talk about cognitive distortions because first of all, it is a human issue, not a trauma issue or a addiction issue, right? This is a human thing. Now I think trauma and addiction can exacerbate our cognitive distortions, but this is a human thing. And it's, and what I know about it is that it is so empowering when anybody can really understand these things, begin to spot them and overcome them. How did you really get turned on to this whole concept of cognitive distortions? Um, I, I used to get very frustrated with a therapist when he would ask me in session, how do you feel? Yeah. And I would say, well, I feel my husband's being selfish. <laughs> I feel like this is going to go on forever. And he would, he would stop me and go, that's not a feeling. And I'd be like, then tell me what a feeling is. Right. <laughs> um, and so I, I had that frustration. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until I was in another therapist led group and they were um, for betrayed spouses and they gave us this packet of information. It was lots of really good information, but one of the handouts was on cognitive distortions. And they're sometimes called, I think in that handout, they were called automatic negative thoughts. Yes. Um, and so, you know, they have lots of different names out there. And I saw myself in the examples of, of lies my brain was telling me mm. that um, I was filling in the blanks in the absence of information and I was making up stories. Brene Brown says the story I'm telling myself, right? Right. right. I was filling in the blanks and, and creating this whole narrative in the absence of real hard, solid, cold, hard data. Yes. And I found it so empowering to be able to start to look for where my brain was, was creating stories um, or creating beliefs. And I think this is so powerful for betrayed spouses, because um, 
we've had our reality taken from us. They, we've had yes. our factual reality stolen from us. Yes. And we search for what's real. We want to know what is real. What is, what is my reality? And mm. we're flooded with all these emotions. We're flooded with these cognitive distortions. Being able to separate out what's an authentic emotion, a feeling, the felt sense in my body yes. that turns into an emotion, and separating that from a, a thought or a belief um, has been very powerful. Right. Absolutely. I I have been that therapist who says, oh, that's not a that's not a feeling. That's yeah, you know, right. That's and the cue that I try to help my clients, it's not a hundred percent, but if you say I feel like, if you if you follow the word feel with the word like, you're about to not share an emotion. <laughs> As if. It's yeah. as if. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Exactly. And and yeah, that's revealing a story. So we, we sort of jumped in and skipped over something, which is defining what a cognitive distortion is. So let's sort of back up and go there. What is a cognitive distortion? It's faulty or inaccurate thinking. Mm. It's a perception or belief mm -hmm. that is uh, negativity is often the defining characteristic. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's some research out there that says that 80% of our thoughts have a negative bias anyway, and that's just how we have survived yes. um, over the years. It's sort of baked in, um, because we're constantly looking for potential threats, but in trauma or whenever there's anxiety or depression, or especially trauma, it can really, it can really be even more than that. Right. And it's part of it is safety seeking where we're missing pieces of information. I don't know the exact thoughts of my husband. I'm not in there thinking his thoughts, observing his thoughts. And, you know, in safety seeking, what he's thinking seems like that's an important thing for me to know to stay safe. Um, and so I fill in the blanks. I, yes. I just, I make assumptions. I draw conclusions uh, without really good data. Right. Right. Yeah. That negativity bias. I've, I've done a lot of reading and research on that too. It's very real. It is absolutely exacerbated by trauma or threat, which of course betrayed partners um, have or are continuing to experience. And, I, and there really is something to re it requiring intention and effort and focus to overcome that. And it's a work that like nobody else can do that for me, right? <laughs> nobody else can do that for me. Yeah. They but, say, uh, you know, you're really in recovery when you start to call yourself on your own stuff. Yeah, that's good. Right? Ooh, I like that. Right. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and, and the other thing that comes up that comes up for me as I hear you say that, and the people who listen to me the most are probably sick of me saying this. It's that Scott Peck quote that right? Mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs. The story I'm telling myself may serve to protect me, but is it really protecting me if it's not rooted in reality? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a betrayed spouse, we need to all of a sudden make a lot of choices. Mm. We may seem like, you know, one of the choices we have is, do I have to, do I stay in this relationship? Yeah. Can I stay in this relationship? Um, where do I find help? Where, where do I go? What do I do? And, um, I don't want to make choices based on faulty thinking or assumptions that haven't been proven or mind reading or t telling the, the future. Um, I want to make choices based in reality, even if yeah. I don't like the choices that I have. Right. Right. And, and something that I think is important to say here, just to validate maybe some of our listeners is that, you know, when you do that mind reading and, and we'll, we'll dive into mind reading later in more, in more depth, but let's take that as an example. When you do that mind reading, it might be rooted in some pretty good past evidence, right? Like, like you've got a whole history of, knowing this guy or, or, or woman and, and their patterns and all of that. And so it doesn't mean that you don't have good reason to believe what you believe, but I think what you're saying is pausing enough to think, I don't know this for sure. Is that, is that accurate? 
Oh, oh yeah. And it's, it's not to say that, that you, these thoughts aren't untrue. Um, it's just that we haven't tested them very well. Mm. Um, and we tend to, we tend to go to the extreme of black and white thinking or, yeah. um, personalizing. Um, here's, here's an example. I really believed, <laughs> I really believed my husband thought I was stupid and unintelligent and gullible. And that was the thought that kept like a BB in a box car, just kept mm. boop, boop, right back and forth. It wouldn't go away. He thinks I'm stupid. He thinks I'm gullible. And in recovery, in authentic recovery, my husband and I talk about recovery all the time. I was able to share that with him. And he was like, oh my gosh, no, I that was, I thought just the opposite, that you were wise, you were intuitive, you did know what was going on, but you just weren't telling me, right? So I was completely wrong about my husband's state of mind or his perception of me. And so if I made all of my decisions based on my husband thinks I'm stupid, you know, it was one thing if he were to come to me and say, Pam, you're really stupid. He never did that. So I didn't have that data. Yeah. It would have been different if you yeah, did. Sure. So if I'm making decisions based on, well, I think my husband thinks I'm stupid, right? It's very right. different than making decisions on, I don't know what my husband thinks. I don't know if my husband knows what he thinks at this point. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that I read in the document you sent me as we were preparing for this time together, um, a document you use in your boundaries course uh, to, to teach this, you wrote that thoughts can be accurate or inaccurate reflections of facts, but your feelings are always authentic and real. Thank you. Absolutely. Such an important distinction to make. And in my course, I even say, if you're multitasking, come back and listen to this. Mm. Your feelings are authentic and real. That's your reality. Yeah. Your feelings are real. You, your feelings aren't right or wrong. Your feelings are not factual or unfactual, um, but your thoughts could be, your thoughts could be factual or unfactual. So you will never hear from me that your feelings are, are a distortion. Your feelings mm. are your feelings. Right. And, and, and I think what we're trying to do is we want to help people get more and more congruence between their experience of reality and what's actually happening. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because that's where we find empowerment and that's where we find healing and um, and that kind of thing. And so if if my without dismissing my feelings, I want to check the facts. And what what I'm remembering here is something I didn't come up with this. I don't remember who did, but um, it's this concept that state drives story, but story drives state. So. So the, the affective emotional state that I'm in, like if I'm, if I'm, if I walk in the house and I'm already irritated and tired, frustrated, agitated, maybe uh, feel some anxiety and threat, I'm then what I encounter when I walk into my house, I'm going to interpret that data through that emotional state. And that's going to, going to inform the story I make up then about the data but then that story actually reinforces the state. The story I'm telling myself chain, can, can inform the emotional state I'm feeling. And what I hear you saying is, and I think this is true, I can't, and it's not even like right to try to change the state in isolation. It, I feel what I feel, but I can change the story. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you think about it in my story, imagine what emotions I was feeling that my husband, my reality was my husband thinks I'm stupid. Wow. Indignation and anger and resentment and all kinds of different, this flood of emotions. Whereas when I step back and say, you know, I, I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what he thinks I could go and ask him. But if I don't know, that leads to some different emotions. I, I don't feel resentment. I don't feel anger. Um, I may I may still feel other feelings that I don't want. Sadness, yeah. fear, questioning, confusion. Fear. Yeah. yeah. But, but but my I might also have curiosity mm -hmm. of I wonder what he does think. 
and interest. And I could go to him and ask him, do you think I'm stupid or what do you think of me? Right. I, I, I can go and gather data, but it leads to some different emotions. Wow. That's so good. So let's, let's get into a few of these particular, um, cognitive distortions that you've identified. And in the, in your boundaries class, you named 20 of them. We will not be going through all 20. So we're just going to pick a few and listeners. Um, if, if, you know, this is really piquing your interest, I'd hope that you will reach out to Pam and, uh, and to learn more. So let's, let's go with catastrophizing. Can you talk a little bit about that, Pam? Uh, catastrophizing is, is seeing only the absolutely worst scenario or even creating, you can combine that with fortune telling, creating like the absolute worst outcome. Yeah. That this is the absolute worst thing that could ever have happened to you or will happen. Wow. And that may or may not, that may be true, but it may not be true. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so how, like, how can a partner catch themselves doing this? What does that look like in real time? Uh, here's, here's a tool that I learned. Um, and I didn't create this tool. Um, journaling is so powerful on so many levels in this journey. Um, but here was a tip. Somebody said, take two different highlighters, Mm. go back over your journaling, just journal, just get the thoughts out. Don't edit, even just bullet point, get all the thoughts and the feelings out, go back through your journal with a yellow highlighter, say, and highlight all the emotions words. And I Mm. use the nonviolent communications uh, feelings list or wheel because it includes just emotions, not judgments. Okay. And so highlight all the emotions words, sad, angry, fearful, hopeless, whatever it is you're feeling. And then go back with a different highlighter and look for um, cognitive distortions, thoughts that might be assumptions where you're drawing conclusions, where you might be thinking, you know, what another person's thoughts are or where you're predicting the future or words like as if, Mm. or always, or never, Mm. or like, or wherever you've added color commentary, some drama. I use an example of, of my husband came in the house and the door slammed. And I could say, well, he came in the door like a bat out of hell. And and right. <laughs> and or he was, he was furious. He came in the door furiously. Well, I don't know if he's feeling fury or, or if he's feeling yeah. furious, right? But if I can make that really boring mm. and take out all the drama and all the color and say, my husband came in the house and the door closed and made a very loud noise and it shook the house. Right. That's, yeah. that's the factually, that's what right. factually happened. Right. And so, but my feelings, but it doesn't matter. Now that doesn't change the fact that I immediately felt scared, yeah. uh, surprised, shock what's going on, curious, um, maybe even anger as a defense, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't change the fact that I felt all those feelings, but those are my feelings that I can take action on. I can't take action on well, my husband's mad. He came in the door and shut the door with an angry slam. I can't take action on that. Mm, So good. So good. Thank you. How about mind reading? And I think this one's tricky. Mind reading is uh, just such a common one because again, I think it's safety seeking. Sure. It's a cognitive distortion for me to think that my husband's thoughts are dangerous. Mm. My husband's thoughts aren't dangerous. His actions can be and his behaviors can cause me danger. He can, he can put me in a dangerous situation, but simply thinking about them. um, And I often say, there are some thoughts that I had (laughs) in early discovery. My husband would not want to know some of the thoughts that went through my mind. I was angry and they were, if I had acted on them, I would have been a dangerous person. Mm. Um, but, uh, my thoughts were never a danger to him because I didn't act on them. And so trying to read my husband's thoughts, and that's me trying to predict what's he going to do? What's going through his mind? What's he thinking? What's he doing? What's he feeling? 
Um, what did that eyebrow raise mean? Um, what did that big sigh mean? Why are his eyes going here? And and so trying to read, so, you know, if, if I think, well, he looked over here, it's very easy for me to think, oh, he's thinking about, he's looking at that woman. And he's thinking about acting out. Yeah. Yes. So I, I just had an experience. So last week I had um, six women um, staying at our new retreat center and we were doing a family of origin intensive. Of course, all these women are also betrayed partners. So we didn't stick to just talking about their childhoods. Of course, things came up about, about their husbands. Right. Um, and this, there was, there was a woman who was sharing and I'm going to have to get her permission or cut this out of the episode. I think she'll be okay with this. She was sharing how, um, she had just really gotten all tangled up with her husband, like a days long uh, conflict because she made up her, the story she was telling herself was he spends all this money, tons of money. And now spending is what he's doing to fill that gap or that hole, right. That he used to fill with acting out. So he's sober from the acting out behavior, but um, now he's just acting out in another way. It's addiction, interaction, right? Transfer, whatever. And so she's still dangerous because the root of it is, you know, not getting treated. And what I, my advice for her was you are getting into a losing battle, arguing over his thoughts, the state of his heart, his intention that like, nobody the heart is deceitful and we get above all things who can know it right that even we don't even know our own stuff and she was like what i said how different would it be to just say when you spend this much money it i feel unsafe and i'm asking you not to do that when you go buy you know a boat without really consulting me and I, or you've consulted me and I've told you, I don't feel good about it. And you do it anyway. I feel really unsafe. That's a whole different conversation. Oh, oh, it is because as the betrayer or, you know, the person who did the betrayal, then I start to defend. Maybe, maybe that's really not my thought process. Right. Maybe I have a whole other motivation that you may or may not like, but then that becomes the thing we're talking about. Yes. Instead of what do you need to feel safe? Yes. Yeah. It's a whole different conversation when I, when I can let go of the stories and I, I'm, we're, we all make up stories. That's a human thing and we have to do it and we need to do it. And I'm not saying, you know, and you're not saying stop making up all stories, right? but, but check them out, check the facts and watch where we focus and what we act on. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. How about personalization as a, as a cognitive distortion? Oh, well, my husband only, you know, betrayed me because I'm not sexy enough, thin enough, rich enough, smart enough. Right. Mm. Um, or um, he should have, oh, he has an addiction, but if he loved me enough, you know, wow. that's more powerful than addiction. And I, spend a lot of time, uh, cause I have a lot of addiction in my family of origin okay. and a lot of work before I even met my current husband, um, on addiction and addiction is so strong that it, it's just sort of a fairy tale. Right. And wow. so personalizing it, um, that this thing happened because of who I am or, or what I did or how that person feels or thinks about me mm. has some correlation to the motivation or even the outcome of how another person behaves. Yeah. Oh, and that's such a powerful one. It can drive so much shame and pain for, for partners. So, you know, how in, in your, in your um, handout, you, you always give examples and then you turn it around. Can I, can I share this one? Cause I thought it was really good. So you wrote an example of personalization. He never would have done this to his ex. He's doing this because I gained five pounds and didn't keep the, the house clean. Right. And then your turn it around is, I don't know if he did or would have done this to his ex. His behaviors are solely his responsibility and he can't blame me or anyone else for his choices. He could have made many other choices that didn't include 
betrayal. Right. Oh, that is so it's hard. I, you know, I don't want to, our listeners think, Oh, okay. You know, like it's just that easy, but it's so empowering. And I think the, the incredible key there is it's acknowledging his choices. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. If you value the content we've shared today, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. For more resources, visit appsats.org. That's A-P-S-A-T-S dot org.